these materials are made from powders and uh, they were invented by the Germans in between the First and the Second World War. Uh, and in fact, this meant that the Germans had a very big uh, advance on uh, our technology leading up to the Second World War um, because we didn't, in the UK, didn't know how to make these materials which are essentially composites between a, a, an inorganic metal carbide, tungsten carbide, and a transition metal cobalt. But because it's made of tungsten, it's a very high atomic number, then you need um, very high voltage electrons to, 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 to pass through the, uh, the very thin foils that we manufactured. And uh, in the 1970s, MPL was involved in one of the first million volt uh, microscopes. This, this is a model of the one million volt electron microscope uh, that we had here at NPL. There were six of them around the country. They were built <coughs> in the late uh, 1960s. And this one came on stream in about 1970, 71. Yeah. Um, the, the advantage was we were getting left behind in this country by both the, the French and the Japanese. Who, who There were many 100 kilovolt electron microscopes around and these allow you to magnify things to up to a, a million times uh, and the problem is that you look through a very very thin sliver of material which is only less than a micron thick a tenth of the thickness of a human hair something like that now the million volt microscope allows you to get through specimens which are five times thicker than you can with a hundred thousand volt microscope and which means that you can start working in three dimensions. And what is more, you can do dynamic experiments in the microscope. So uh, one of the uh, things we were able to do was um, study um, dislocations in, um, in, in metals. And uh, one of the things uh, we needed it for was um, to um, predict the lifetime of power stations. This, this is a two-storey building, and the whole microscope is mounted upon an anti-vibration mount based on a, a large concrete block, block man, mounted on springs. And a whole series of different stages were designed so that we could, um, we've got an environmental cell so that you could look at things with air still around them and look at biological samples. Because this million volt microscope costs so much, we had to keep it going morning, afternoon and evening and I had to keep a record of, of this. And any free time I used to give, without telling the accountants, I give free to any, any medical people who are studying cancer and things like that. And I didn't charge them, so I, you know, I lost the cost elsewhere. <laughs> or we could look at a miniature creep machine. We were doing in situ straining experiments in the microscope. Um, Concord was all the rage then. We looked at a whole variety of different materials uh, when a Concorde comes down from its you know, high flight level, it, over, it heats to about two or 300 degrees. And uh, we were working um, really only a few months or so ahead of uh, the, you know, Concorde. And um, we were able to do a study um, deformation. So what we had is a heating stage and also a tensile stage. So you could actually heat these um, thin foils and stretch them and see what was going on. I was one of the first uh, early users of the machine in the early 1970s. As I, as I think I mentioned before, looking at high atomic number of materials that contained, for example, tungsten. And um, it's very important to be able to see the structure. You need to have a very high uh, um, applied voltage to the electrons to get them to transmit through that material. And uh, we were very interested in how those materials had been used in service. So we would take materials, for example, from a, a rock tool that had been deformed, and we were able to analyse the, uh, the different internal features of the microstructure that controlled the performance of the material. Uh, and it was only by looking through very thick foils that we would be confident that we were seeing um, features that were representative of the true structure. In those days, of course, what you were seeing, the image, was the, a phosphor. Um, uh, a, 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 screen, a screen that was on a that, that reacted to the electrons that gave a flash of light and produced the image. Well, 
there have been such great progress made in image intensification. Even the cameras you're using today will now have an image intensifier and you can work at low light levels. Well, in those days, of course, we didn't. And, of course, we were recording dynamic events using very large, spool um, Ampex tape recorders with sort of tape about and uh, sort of about 30, 40 centimetres wide and so on. The whole thing was brought to a sudden stop. Um, all my staff were dispersed. But these days, with modern microscopes and image intensifiers, you can do the same as what you can do with the million volt microscope um, uh, at, at a lower voltage. The million volt microscope, um, you, you can get suffer from radiation damage in, in the specimens, and Harwell used it for precisely that, for determining the effect of radiation in nuclear reactors. So they were using that. But, uh, after that, it, um, if you didn't want radiation damage, it was turned out that the optimum voltage, so not too much radiation damage, um, was about um, 400, 200 to 400,000 volts. So million volt microscope went out of, um, out of fashion because they were quite expensive to run.